Thank you, Colin. Our second speaker is Alex Fairfax Cholmley, who is a historian of revolutionary justice and of the terror, uh, which is what his PhD, uh, completed in 2012, uh, was on, and he's developing that into a book. He has an article recently published in uh, European History Quarterly, and he's also worked on uh, print culture and the French revolutionary tradition. He's lecturer in history at the University of Exeter, and he also holds a three-year British Academy postdoctoral fellowship for a project on victims of the French Revolutionary Terror, 1793 to 1799. Uh, and that, I think, is what he'll be talking about today under the title, The Victim Strikes Back? Question mark. Print Culture After the Terror in France, 1794 to 1799. Alex. Thank you, David. Um, just, sorry, there's just going to be a slight pause because my computer has decided to uh, not recognise this projector. Hold on one second. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, thanks again, David. Um, so, uh, I've got two things to, to say to begin with, just uh, to avoid confusion. One, when a blank slide comes up, it's not because of a technical malfunction. It is deliberate. Um, and secondly, you're going to see some... Uh, um, reproductions of, of this uh, print, print documents from the period. Um, you're probably not going to be able to read the text because it's going to be quite small. The idea is not that you should be trying to read the text, but it's just to give you a sense of what these look like as objects, essentially. Um, and I think that will be, you'll see the relevance with the paper that I give. Um, Bronislaw Bachko's enduring influence over our collective study of the second half of the French Revolutionary Decade has been secured by the clarity with which he argued for a longer view on that central revolutionary event, the ending of the terror. Bachko's Comment Sortir de la Terreur highlighted the rich analytical possibilities that came with treating this ending not as the act of Robespierre's overthrow on 9th Thermidor, but rather as a, what he called a process that was central to the Thermidorian reaction as a whole, and by inference, constituted an important legacy for the rest of the decade as well. For Bachko, quote, the terror was not brought to an end by the fall of Hospier. It was a road to be discovered and travelled, end quote. With the first, and indeed the majority of explorers, being the Parisian political elite. In this paper, I want to populate Bachko's road out of the terror with a much more diverse crowd of French men and women and see by what other paths they might lead us through the later history of revolutionary France. The crowd I want to follow are the victims of the terror of March 1793 to July 1794, using a far broader definition of the term victim than is customary. I therefore want to track where I can, not just the post-terror activities of the relatives, friends and acquaintances of the thousands who were guillotined, but also those men and women who experienced revolutionary justice and survived, which is a very substantial number, the hundreds of thousands who were imprisoned, or simply those who felt intimidated by what they could see going on around them. This combination of those directly and indirectly affected by the various mechanisms of, of terrorist surveillance, repression and violence produces a vast and somewhat unwieldy constituency, but one with great relevance to the study of France in its post-terror phase. And yet, as Ronan Steinberg has recently noted, quote, for the most part, the vast historiography of the terror has been devoid of victims, end quote. And this is just as much the case after July 1794 as before. One way in which we can track some of these victims is through their print output. Late 18th century France was a print-savvy country, and by the middle of the revolutionary decade, its citizens, especially but by mo no means exclusively in urban areas, were familiar with the idea that print was not just a tool of government propaganda, rather it was a medium that could be exploited by individuals too and across quite a broad social spectrum. Print was the perfect weapon for striking back, be it through the settling of old scores, the starting of new ones, or just a way of trying to set the record straight after suffering reputational damage. The resulting petitions and pamphlets are the source base for my paper today. I am yet to attempt a comprehensive sampling of relevant print collections, but some indication of the scale of victims' activities in this area is given by the fact that 22 out of 137 print documents in one tiny part 
of the British Library's French Revolutionary Tracts collection belong to this genre. This is a collection that stretches from the 1780s into the 19th century, by the way. And my argument is also drawing on other print collections, but I, I don't want to go into, into the detail of that now. Um, you're welcome to ask me questions about that afterwards. Uh, this focus on victims, coupled with this type of source material, is designed to help plug a considerable gap in the historiography of the second half of the revolutionary decade. Broadly speaking, historians have traditionally focused on two aspects of post-revolutionary of post-terror revolutionary history. An elite reaction among Parisian political circles and the popular violence of the white terror in the Midi. While there has been some exemplary scholarship on the Thermidorian and directorial periods over the last decade, it has not altered this basic pattern. In other words, outside of an, an, an unruly South, post-terror France is habitually analyzed from a top-down perspective. Tellingly, this has remained the case even where victims have been allowed to form part of the narrative, as with the prominence given to the trial of Jean-Baptiste Carrier right at the end of 1794. Historians from Bachko to Corinne Gomez Le, Le Comenton, Howard Brown, Laura Mason and Ronan Steinberg have consistently highlighted the importance of this trial in shaping a national reaction to the terror, citing the huge publicity the case garnered as well as the questions it raised about the scale and barbarity of terrorist repression and the complicity of elected officials. However, one of the effects of such an analysis is to create the impression that the French population somehow needed the terror explained to them in its aftermath. A broader focus on victims' activities, including within the print culture of the period, shows, entirely unsurprisingly, that just as people had known perfectly well what had been going on during the terror as it happened, they were, individually and collectively, going through their own process of thinking through that terrorist experience in its aftermath and how then to react to it. This process of striking back had already begun and would have continued irrespective of the political decision to remove Carrier's immunity and put him on trial before the Paris Revolution Tribunal. Um, so let us now look in more detail at was uh, what was produced as a result. Um, in the late autumn of 1794, this pamphlet made its appearance in the Thermidorian public sphere. Dramatically titled, My Return to Life After 15 Years of Pain, it was written by one Joseph Paris de Lepinard, a prominent citizen of Lille, who had been running his own very profitable local postal service and newspaper since well before the revolution. Lepinard played an active role in local affairs after 1789, as befitted a man who edited and printed the Gazette of the Department of the North, a rebranding of his old newspaper, but he then fell foul of political rivals in the summer of 1793, that is, in the early months of the terror. He was arrested and transferred to Paris in August of that year on the orders of the local municipality and deputies from the National Convention who had been sent to the area, so-called representatives of the people on mission, who um, played a key role in administering the terror um, outside the capital. Reading between the lines of his account, he seems to have had a habit of picking fights with people of both local and national influence and this left him vulnerable once the various elements of state-sanctioned repression began to mesh together during the course of 1793. He was incarcerated right through the terror and then released two and a half months after the fall of Robespierre on the 26th Vendemier Year 3, which is 17 October 1794. My Return to Life was printed some time after this, as is common with this type of material, you never quite know when things are printed, um, probably soon after as is suggested by an apologetic note to the reader about the number of errors in the text, which Lepinard blames on his being, quote, forced to rush the publication of this, quote, of this work, end quote. The printing was most likely done in Paris, but again, like in common with this material in, as a whole, you never quite know sometimes. Um, the pamphlet is a considerable piece of work, spanning 92 pages. Uh, revolutions in general, uh, rather like with Rosberg, they did like to... Uh, embellish uh, and make things as long as possible whenever they could. Um, so what does it consist of? At first glance, it looks like a densely homogenous text, but closer inspection reveals a series of distinct but interconnected parts. This mosaic quality is significant for my general argument, so I'm going to describe it in some detail. There are at least six different sections, and I'm going to provide a, a quotation from, from each. 
1. Pages 2 to 6. Details of Lepinard's arrest and transfer to Paris in the summer of 1793. Quote, It was during the night of the 5th, 6th of the month of August that my wife and I were seized like common criminals and imprisoned in the town we had lived in for 17 years. 2. Pages 7 to 55. Tales of horror from the Paris prison system during the terror. 24 hours passed by, and what hours, or rather what a century, without the bolts being drawn back again. I was enveloped in a deathly silence. Who would come to get me out? 3. Pages 56 to 71. What contemporaries called a conduite politique, which is a narrative account of Lepinard's life and principles from 1776 until the siege of Lille by the Austrians in 1792. Quote, I was the first in Lille, along with citizen Maurice Coulon, my neighbour and my friend, to offer to equip and provide for a man to serve in the army of the Republic, at that time when the Prussians were destroying the plains of Champagne and the patrie had been declared to be in danger. End quote. 4. Pages 72 to 81, naming and attacking his denouncers from 15 months previously. Quote, it is necessary that right next to this depiction, that is of the misfortune Lepina has suffered, is exposed in all its deformity, in all its horror, that of the barbarous authors of the torture which tore me apart for 15 months. Who therefore are my executioners? A wicked nobody called Lavalette, the ferocious Duem, the monster unnamed. I will add without hesitation to these tigers, Bentabol and Levasseur, so General Lavalette is a Parisian radical who was serving in the Army of the North, and those last three are deputies in the National Convention. Five, pages 82 to 3 and 91 to 2, lining up a compensation claim. And here he's addressing Deputy Bentabal directly, quote, I demand of the National Representation, that is the National Convention, the ability to pursue you for compensation in relation to my ruin, my total ruin, which is your own handiwork, end quote. Six, finally, pages 85 to 90, documents to support his case. These were commonly known by their legal term, pièce justific justificative, although Lepinard preferred the more colourful monuments of the tyranny which threw me into chains. He introduces the final such document thus, quote, Finally, I obtained through the recommendation of Representative Commissioners Bourdon de Loise and Legendre my Certificate of Freedom drawn up by the Committee of General Security. It is phrased in this way, end quote. And there follows a full transcription of the said document, and, and it's at the bottom of the slide on the right. Lepinard's pamphlet provides a flavour of the range of tactics used by victims when they took to the printing press, and the diverse subject matter this genre of material contains. It is, in truth, a difficult document to classify. Certain elements, the title, and that large section on the horrors of prison life, belong to the prison memoir, a melodramatic anecdotal genre which has never inspired serious scholarly engagement. Furthermore, the intended audience for this pamphlet is hard to pin down. Is it intended for the commercial market? Um, or does the author have a more targeted audience in mind, in the National Convention, among those he is denouncing, or perhaps in his hometown of Lille? However, beneath these uncertainties lie three themes, three ways of striking back, in fact, which deserve our close attention. Rehabilitation, denunciation, and historicization. The final part of this paper will trace these themes across victims' print output more generally. So, rehabilitation. We have already seen the theme of personal rehabilitation emerge from Lepinard's pamphlet especially in that conduite politique section, where he set out his history of civic and patriotic virtue from 1776 all the way through to the revolution itself. This is a common element within victims' print output, as when one Jean-Claude Butet, recently acquitted by the Paris Revolution Tribunal, operating in its post 9 thermidor guise, provided details of a life service in uniform from the American War of Independence through to National Guard service, where he explained how, quote, I rose up the ranks thanks to the confidence of my fellow citizens." End quote. The trend continues into the directory, where in 1798, Joseph-Marie Barral can be found using his impressive revolutionary biography, including a stint as president of Grenoble's Military Criminal Tribunal, to protest the impact on him of legislation limiting the civil rights of the relatives of emigres. I think it is important to ask 
the simple question, why was this felt to be necessary? After all, one might think that the rehabilitation of reputations was assured simply by having been targeted during a terrorist period that was, post-9 Thermidor, regarded with widespread opprobrium. Yet clearly the reputation of the terror's victims was not felt to be secure, even when the machinery of the terror was being condemned on a daily basis. This is in fact an illustration of the extent to which political and social legitimacy was in flux post-9 Thermidor, for nobody quite knew where France's enemies were, apart from being certain that they could be anywhere, including among the hundreds of thousands affected by the terror. I believe there was also another dynamic at work here, which has been consistently underplayed in the historiography, and that is the notion of collective rehabilitation, not of a particular victim, but of their family, friends and local community. Here the concern was to address the charge that terrorist repression was not resisted at the time it actually took place, a charge that can be seen developing simultaneously among both politicians and the National Convention, who had a clear motive for alleging that they had either not known what had been going on under their own authority, or else that they had been too terrified to object, and in some of the literature produced by victims, especially the more melodramatic prison narratives, where a commercial edge could be found in emphasizing how one suffered in splendid isolation. A good example of the dynamic of collective rehabilitation, which complicates the standard picture of Thermidorian France awakening from a silent terror, comes from Moulin, the hometown of 32 men executed by a revolutionary, a revolutionary tribunal in Lyon on 11 Niveaux year 2, 31st January 1794. Sometime during the summer of 1795, their surviving families commissioned an anonymous individual to investigate the case and write this detailed submission to the national authorities in the hope of securing a posthumous annulment of this judgment. However, while this investigation and the resulting pamphlet are motivated by a desire to rehabilitate the men who were killed, there was also clearly a wish to put on record the collective protest against this repression that was made at the time it had originally happened. For example, when what the memoir describes as the catastrophe arrives in early 1794, the 32 men arrested as suspects are followed directly in the text by another number, 72. This is the number of people who, quote, protested to the department about this arrest, end quote. And it was this protest, according to the memoir, that the arresting authority, the local municipality, sought to punish by pushing the victims' names further up the judicial chain and so guaranteeing more violent punishment. Secondly, denunciation. A more direct way to strike back was to denounce those allegedly responsible for one's suffering. And victims were not shy of pointing the finger at those responsible for their experiences during the terror. Auguste La Chaboussière, whose pamphlet Eight Months a Detainee at the Madelonette, it's a, a Paris prison, came out sometime in late 1794 or 1795. This linked his denouncer to a broader class of traitor, claiming that the man responsible for causing his arrest and prolonged imprisonment was, quote, one of those people who were born to do wrong to those nearest to them and to the shame of all humanity, a groveling valet to power in whoever's hands such power lay, too cowardly to conspire by himself, but always ready to join with the winning conspirators. In this example, La Chabossière refrained from revealing his denouncer's actual identity, probably because it seems that it was his son-in-law. But as we saw in the Lepinard case, others were not so restrained. Given that imprisonment, or worse, was a very real possibility for suspected terrorists as the reaction gathered pace, this was a high-stakes activity. Evidence of the impact of such denunciations is difficult to track on a case-by-case -case basis, but can be inferred from the response in kind by those under pressure from similar allegations. Thus, Hugues Destreim published a three-page defence when he was labelled a brigand by Deputy Mai during the first year of the directory for, alleging, for allegedly having engaged in profiteering when acting as a supplier to Toulouse during the terror. By this stage of the decade, the ubiquity of a pattern of denunciation and defence in print that revolved around competing histories of the terrorist experience can be glimpsed in the response of one Tridon simply to his dismissal from his administrative post in the capital. Unemployment is, to our eyes, somewhat hysterically compared 
to the worst excesses of the terror, Robespierre and Fouquier Tinville. Are we still living through those shocking and horrible days when death's blade hung over everyone, he asked. It is also instructive to view denunciations in print as forming but one part of a two-pronged attack by victims, who also immediately began to take cases to court in order to claim compensation. Lepinard, for example, in addition to appealing to the National Convention for the opportunity to claim damages against Deputy Bentabal, as I've already highlighted, claimed to already be pursuing his jailer in the Abbey prison through the Paris legal system. To my knowledge, no concerted research has been done at a local level on how widespread or effective this method of redress was post-terror. However, Howard Brown has drawn on some limited information provided by Albert Matthias to explain provisions made by the National Convention in the summer of 1795 to limit a nationwide wave of prosecutions being made against local terrorist era officials regarding property seizures, forced loans, and abuse of power more generally. This is an area where my current research project will hope to, ve will hope to develop further in the near future. Some indication of the potential links between this legal angle and victims' print output more generally is given by the activity of one Claude Dupré, a printer from Eton. In the, summer or in the autumn of 1795, he published this pamphlet, publicizing his successful efforts to have a parcel of land restored to him that he had lost to a neighbor during the terror. Dupré's argument was that he had been literally terrorized into signing away land and with it a long-standing ambition to build a mill to this rival landowner who had secured a post on the local surveillance committee and had exploited this position of influence for personal gain. The pamphlet combined various elements of the victim's print genre that I have highlighted already, such as conduit politique sections and pièces justificatives, with a copy of the legal ruling that returned his land to him. And I've, I've noted that in the slides where the, where the pages are. Finally, um, historicization. Both tactics that I've highlighted so far uh, in this paper, rehabilitation and denunciation, as well as the interconnected activity in the legal sphere, required victims to collect and disseminate physical evidence in support of their claims and narratives. These were often then highlighted by being collected into a single body of proof at the end of the document, as in Lepinard's creation, the section la usually labelled as pièce justificative. It is fascinating to pick up the traces of the physical work that must have been involved. In the group case from Moulin, for example, I've already mentioned that it seems that the pamphlet in question was written by an anonymous individual, presumably on behalf of the widows of the executed men. Was it this person who also su succeeded in gaining access to the complete file for the case from Leon's legal archives? For somebody did just that. The, the, the slide you have on screen now um, shows this section of the pamphlet, which gives full transcripts of the key documentation from the investigation and trial of those involved. In other cases, it would appear that wives themselves play a key role in securing documents from local and national bodies. Indeed, an extensive footnote in Lepinard's pamphlet quotes a letter from his wife to the author while he was still in jail after Thermidor, recounting her detective work on his behalf including a meeting with the ferocious Duhem that Lepinard went on to denounce in one of the passages I highlighted earlier. Marie-Jean Guerrier was the widow of a farmer and miller called Claude Légère from the commune of Rossé just to the west of Paris, who had been guillotined during the terror. She had access to her deceased husband's Paris Revolution Tribunal case dossier when her pamphlet petitioning the convention for the restitution of the family's property was drawn up soon after 9 Thermidor. This allowed her to contest the official narrative contained in the indictment and to point to evidence of her husband's innocence in the written records of the interviews conducted in preparation for that prosecution. While copies did not form part of the petition, the text states that, quote, all these documents from the case, presumably meaning copies of those documents, are presented with this petition for the examination of the National Convention, end quote. The result of this widespread practice of collation, analysis, publication and dissemination, which has been implicit in the previous sections uh, that I've talked about with rehabilitation and denunciation, was that victims' print output was developing countless histories of the terror right across the post-terror period. This historicization inevitably fused together personal, local and national perspectives on the revolution's past, present and future. 
In so doing, victims were reacting against the terror in parallel to, and often independently of, the centrally directed responses the historiography has made more familiar thus far, namely speeches by leading politicians, the very public trials of high-profile terrorists like Carrier and Joseph Le Bon, and acts of legislation. So, in conclusion, in a recent article, Colin Jones set out the way in which deputies in the National Convention successfully wrote the people of Paris out of the revolution of Ninth Thermidor. He called for a new approach to the post-terror period, arguing that, quote, if the period following Ninth Thermidor was about depopularizing the revolution, we must try all the harder to popularize our accounts of those debates and struggles so as to produce a better history uh, with the people left in. I believe we can profitably expand this manifesto, with Colin's permission perhaps, uh, to bring the victim centre stage as one, of the, uh, as one way of ensuring that post-terror history beyond the Parisian elite can be analysed in its own right, without an underlying assumption that the reactions of the general population, aside from the violence in the midi, must always be understood with reference to the opinions, initiatives and directives coming from central authorities. Victims' use of print during this period provides a rich source base for doing so and allows us to analyse the activities of a cross-section of French men and women. Their widespread adoption of strategies of rehabilitation and denunciation offer insight into personal, local post-terror narratives that are otherwise very difficult to access. Furthermore, these same narratives complicate received wisdom on the way in which a national understanding of the terror itself developed, since their prevalence casts doubt on long-held assumptions about the importance of the, of the official narrative developed at the centre. Indeed, I would argue that victims in striking back were in many ways the first researchers, archivists and historians of the French terror and hardly less biased than some professional ones since. Thank you. <laughs>